Okay, well, welcome. It's good to see so many faces coming along to the um, ever-excited AGM. Um, the idea of the AGM, right, let's introduce myself first. I'm Matt Williams. I've spoken to some of you this week, but this community is getting so large, I don't get a chance to talk to every single person who comes to this conference. So to help solve that, I do encourage any of you, if you see me around, if you see me sitting at the society desk, if you see me out in the mill tonight, whatever, do feel free to come up and say hello and, and introduce yourselves. I'm I'd love to meet every single person involved in research software engineering in the world, if I possibly could. So please do come up and say hello. Uh, that's not on the right one. Okay, so quick agenda, just to give you a sense of how the time is going to pass. Quick introduction, and then we're gonna be handing over to a selection of the trustees to give an update on the various different goings on that society has been working on over the last 12 months or so. Um, then we're going to have a Q&A session. So during all of the presentations leading up to that, the Slido should already be open. It's uh, at a different location to the Slido that we've been using for the rest of the conference, the AGM being its own little uh, silo away. So if you go to slido.com and enter the code AGM23, that will take you to the page where you can ask any questions throughout the session. So we'll give about 10 minutes or so for the Q&A. Um, there's bound to be questions that we don't get to asking, answering all of. So in that case, we will collect them and we'll probably do some offline answers and put them into the mailing list next time one goes out and put them up on our website. So if we don't get to answer your question here in the session in person, we will make the effort to give you an answer to it after the fact or come up and chat to one of us afterwards and we're happy to talk to you. And then finally, at the end of all that, we have our trustee elections happening. So at the end of uh, all the updates, uh, Dave will be giving uh, a summary and update and the results thereof of the elections of the new trustees. So that'll be happening at the end of the session. And that's when the trustees will hand over. Okay, so purpose of AGM is to vote on resolutions. We're not doing any of that stuff today, except the voting on the uh, trustee candidates. But I think the really important thing is for us to update you folks on what we're doing. There's probably some people in this room who are members of the society. Can I get a show of hands if you are a member, paid up member of the society? Wonderful. Good to see you all here. And can I get a show of hands if you're not a member? You're very welcome. Wonderful. It's so great to see you coming along, seeing what this is about. Even if you're not a member of the society, you're still a member of the community. And that's much, much more important in many ways. So we want to update you on what we've been doing and explain to you how things work and what we've been working on. And then finally to answer and ask some questions. So uh, about a month ago, we sent out our annual report. Every year we do a report telling you what we've been working on. The present presentations today are more or less a condensed form of what goes into that. If you want to read the full thing, it goes into details of what we've been working on all these avenues. Please do have a look, the link's there and the QR code's there, or it's um, up on our website. Okay, then on to the president's report. So the role of the president is more or less to have an overarching oversight and strategic view of what the society is doing to sort of manage the rest of the trustees and to make sure the whole thing just keeps on ticking along and continues to exist so that we can keep on running events like this conference. So that's really kind of the coming to the, the idea of what the society is all about. There's reasons to be working in research software engineering, but why do you need a society as an independent organization to make that, you know, to make that happen? Well, we help run the conference. We provide the initial starting funds to pay deposits and get the conference going, help provide some organizing power from people on the committee, pay for um, organizing um, from external parties and make sure the thing actually goes ahead and runs. Of course, a lot of the actual work is done by the conference committee themselves rather than trustees, but it's all society business. We offer financial support, and this is something which is still rather underutilized. Finance will give an update on it later, but if you're running an event or something, you can ask us for money. I'll let other people talk more about that. And we give a community and a voice. So the Slack channel is managed by the society. So we give you a place where you can go and chat about as technical or as social or as political issues as you want to and meet other people from the community. So we are a charity in the UK. We're a registered charity with the Charity Commission. That means that we are not here to make a profit. The money that we charge you for conference tickets and for membership fees all gets folded back into stuff which supports our charitable aims. And they're here down at the bottom. They are deliberately vague and broad. They are to advance education, particularly, but not exclusively, blah, blah, blah and to promote an advanced research. 
particularly, but not exclusively, blah, blah, blah. So anything to do with education and research is under our purview, but of course, with a focus on research software engineers, but importantly, research software engineering in general. Now, the question came up um, in the US RSE talk about how does the society fit in with the international movements of RSE? And we're in a, a unique situation. We were the first society in the world to form and start um, formalizing um, how these things work. So we've taken part in helping other international charities in their own countries, so other national charities in their own countries get started. There's many, many countries which don't have a national, uh, national uh, association. And so we provide a home for those people so they can come along and take part in the community, even if they haven't got something in their own country to set up. Maybe they will start one later on. And then in the UK, we are the home of research software engineering. And this is why we run the conference here in the UK. So the trustee board, we are the people who keep the, the gears turning and keep things moving. Um, we have a, a constitution which governs how all this sort of stuff works. Each year, one third of us has to stand down. It's a bit fuzzy, you know, some people stand down a bit early and lots of numbers aren't divisible by three. But regardless, this year we have four of our trustees who are finishing their term. Um, that's Ian Cottam, Alex Coleman, Jamie Quinn and Fergus Cooper. Some of them are here in the room, some of them might be watching online and some of them aren't here. Uh, and then we have seven trustees who are continuing on carrying on doing the work. And we are going to be, at the end of the session today, electing a set more trustees to round off the board. Now, I always tell my students when I'm teaching them about data visualization, don't present your data in a table, do it as a graph. And so I spent some time last week making a picture of the ages and the sort of the eras of trustees over the years, which when I actually stood back and looked at it, I realized how tall this graph is. And that shows how many different people over the last five, six years have been giving and donating their time just to the trusteeship. That's not even including all of the other stuff that the community does. So this really shows how many people have got us to where we are today. And each of us individually, it's just one line, but together we're a whole society. And that's, I think, really powerful. So how can you help if you don't want to stand as a trustee? Well, you can stand as a trustee. Next summer, we'll be putting out another call for trustees if you would like to get involved as a trustee. But that's not the only way to help out. One really important thing you can be doing, get involved in the conference committee for next year. I imagine it'll be very soon that we'll be putting out a call to take part in the conference committee for RSECon 24. That's a really, really great way to start getting involved in the community. That's how I got started. I helped out with the um, RSE conferences back, back in the days before COVID. That's a really good way to get started into the community. But we also have some specific uh, groups and working groups and special interest groups that are coming together. And this is a way that you can take part in the work that we do without having to commit to the legal responsibilities of being a trustee, which is um, of, of often a much easier ask of, of you folks who want to help out. So there's two working groups we have particularly who are doing the work of, of running the things of the society, but taking, uh, taking members of the community in to, to help out with what we do. And that's the communications and publicity working group. They're the folks who run the newsletter, look after Twitter, post message, messages on Slack, look after all of that outward facing stuff. They're looking for people to come along and help out. If you just have a little bit of time to add a few items to a newsletter, do some editing or some reviewing, man the Twitter channel for like uh, a, a week's, you know, out of a year or something like that. Send an email to comms at societyrse.org and that will take you there. We also have our EDIA and role diversity group. You might have seen them. You might have been interviewed by them this week. They're looking for people to come along and join and help them with what they are trying to do. If you have new ideas of avenues they could be looking at, or if you just want to help out with those existing activities, I think they'd be very happy to have you. The QR code there on the screen takes you to the link at the bottom there, societyrc.org slash community slash get involved with all the details there. So you can, you don't have to memorize these email addresses. We're also just starting two new special interest groups. Working groups are there to perform tasks, special interest groups are there to provide a place to chat about topics. So we've got two special interest groups, which we're hoping are going to get formed in the next weeks, depending on how long it takes to finalize bits of paperwork and so on. So we've got a medical devices SIG. We've got James Graham here in the audience. Um, he's trying to put that together. So if you're interested in helping get that kickstarted or just taking part in it as a member, please send James Graham an email. And we also have a project management SIG, 
Now I put down Martin's email address for this, but I know that Sarah Jaffa is also involved in uh, setting that up. So if you are interested in project management as it pertains to research software engineering, and you'd like to talk to like-minded folks, that's a great place to help kickstart that community and start having that conversation. But you're not constrained to only the ideas that we've thought of. If you've got something you'd like to start, a group you'd like to put together, we can help support that. We can provide you with funding to run events. We can provide you with the technology like mailing lists and websites and all that sort of stuff behind the scenes. We can provide you with trustee time sometimes to help you kind of kickstart the process. So maybe on training or teaching or accreditation or any of the issues that we've been talking about this week, if you think you'd like to kickstart a little community to discuss a certain topic, please do get in contact and we'll uh, give you a hand putting all of that together. And if you just don't know what you want to help out with at all, but you just feel like I wanna help, but I don't know which of these things is my thing. We've got a simple Google form with just your name and email address at this QR code here, which will just give us your name and email address. And then we'll contact you when things happen in case you want to get involved with all of that. So lots and lots of ways to get involved if you want to, but simply by being here at the conference, you're you're already involved, so thank you all for that. Another thing we've been doing over the last two years, so this time last year, we started this process of forming regional RSE groups. Since COVID happened, everyone sort of stopped meeting in person, um, but there's been a slow sort of growth back to having in-person events, and that's obviously facilitated greatly by having groups of people physically near to you. In the world of Zoom, etc., being near each other doesn't seem as important, but there is real value in being in a room altogether. And so these regional RSE groups are a way to have a little community local to you, something where you could travel there for a day's meeting and then get home again by the evening. That's the kind of size we're thinking about doing. So we have a whole bunch of different local communities around the UK. There are gaps in this. There's not one here for Northern Ireland, for example. There's whole parts of the UK that aren't covered by this. So if you're interested in starting one, get in contact with us or ask around on Slack and find out if there's people from your area that might want to start a regional group. Starting by running just like an online seminar series or something like that is a really good way of starting to build this community. With that, I'm going to hand over to Martin, who's going to talk about conference and events. Uh, first, sort of conferences. Um, uh, we're obviously at one of these now. Um, last year uh, is the conference that sort of falls within our kind of reporting period for, for, for this AGM. It was our first in-person conference since uh, 2019. In between, we had uh, a series of uh, 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 online RSE events, and we had uh, the online RSE conference in 2021. Um, there was 350 attendees, uh, you know, capacity. We had 43 community contributed talks, 13 workshops and walkthroughs, and, and, and four sort of satellite events, you know, organized by various sort of subgroups in the community. Um, and again, you know, huge thanks to Mark Tanner and Claire Wyatt for, like, the massive effort uh, sort of organizing that. Um, we'll talk more, I guess, retrospectively about the 2023 conference next year, um, and you're all experiencing it at the moment. Uh, but this is the first one with both in-person and remote options, and we'd, we'd love to hear from those of you who have been attending remotely, how that's been going. And we've had 370 people, um, 325 in-person and, and, and 45 remote. Um, Matt talked about uh, the fact that we can support events out in the community, and I just want to stress that there is sort of money available. We underspent sort of like our budget on this this year. Um, we supported five, five events uh, with funding out of seven requests. Uh, so we, we sort of tend to support sort of one example of, of uh, you know, we tend to only support a few repeating events. Um, so uh, th those were uh, an unconference bringing together the RSE Asia and RSC Australia and New Zealand communities. Um, we saw a slide about the, the, the regional groups, so we supported two, two regional events, the, the RSC Midlands uh, annual meeting and the Research Software London and South East uh, sort of annual workshop. Um, we uh, supported a, a diverse uh, EDI talk, so this is a, a series of talks um, on diversity within the RSC community, uh, and uh, we're supporting the uh, festival of the, the Hidden Ref, which uh, uh, Simon Hedrick uh, has, uh, uh, is, uh, is organising in, 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 in the next uh, um, month or so. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Jamie, uh, who will uh, update us on membership. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I'll talk a little bit about membership. Um, so yeah, we have nearly 700 members, or depending on which number you look at, we might actually have over 700 members. Um, but 
that's been growing very steadily, despite the, the membership group having um, been actually quite quiet this year and focusing on, on other things. Um, you can see here uh, the spike from uh, last year's conference and then just nice steady growth. Um, part of what we've been trying to do over the past two years is uh, transition away from our current membership platform, many of whom you might not realize is just running quietly behind the scenes, but it is uh, a source of frustration for many trustees. So we're trying to uh, transition that. Um, we've nearly chosen an alternative, but it needs a little bit more testing. I hope some more uh, oomph from uh, the new trustees will, will move that along. Um, that's really all I actually want to speak about uh, membership, but I think I'm not next to talk about uh, EDIA and also role diversity, because this year um, the two groups used to be separate, but um, I decided to to combine them this year just so we had more people to do more things. And I think that was a really nice decision uh, for this year. But I'd like to have them as two different groups. So if you're interested in either um, EDIA work, uh, quality, diversity, inclusivity, or accessibility, or role diversity, what makes our, our, our work different, um, please do get in touch. Um, this year, uh, we have actually had more community members than trustees, which I think has been wonderful. It means the, the group can continue on after trustees uh, move on and there's a little bit more uh, continuity and robustness in the group. Um, we, as a result, we've had to reorganize uh, the way we actually access various uh, pieces of, of, our, of our management and, and our documentation uh, so that, that everyone can have equal access, uh, no matter whether they're a trustee or, or a member uh, of any kind. Um, we, in terms of activities that we've, that we've been doing over the past year, uh, we've had a EDIA focused leader survey that has just gone out. So if you're a leader and listening to this, please do fill that out as soon as you get it. Um, we rebooted what is now the RSC Journeys, but used to be called Case Studies, um, with a view of just celebrating the diversity within our community and understanding um, where we've come from, who we are uh, in various different ways. So if you have a story to share, uh, little or as big as you want, please do come uh, see us beside the, the society table. Um, we've also been running some uh, role diversity and disability sessions at the Unconference today. That seems to have gone really well, so thank you for your participation in that, if you did. Um, and you might have seen us uh, having these little ribbons, and so if you'd like to make a little ribbon that tells other people who you are in some sense, um, then please do come uh, to our our table beside the, the society stall um, and, and make your own little ribbon. It's a nice little relaxing time to, uh, to <laughs> away from the, the franticness of the conference. Um, yeah, so please do, if you're interested, come join us having fun and just doing, doing things for the community. Um, yeah, I'd like to point out, I actually photoshopped James into this. He, he wasn't actually there. And I meant to make it really funny, but I accidentally made it quite convincing. <laughs> Yeah. But anyway, yeah, please, uh, please do join us if you're interested. And I'll pass over to Evelina. So thank you. I will give you an update on communications, but this has been largely work of Ian Kotam and Alex Coleman. So first, some statistics. We have currently over 7,000 followers on Twitter. I put in the new logo, which I feel very ambiguous about. Uh, we have over 4,000 members on Slack, and our newsletter has over 1,200 uh, subscribers. If you don't subscribe to the newsletter, please do, because it includes quite a lot of interesting uh, notes about things happening in the community, uh, events that are happening, any news. Uh, we also have a LinkedIn group, which is much less active. Uh, and I also included a little graph showing how is our Slack doing. And Slack is our main communication platform for the community. And as you can see, the green line shows weekly active members, and that's going up. You can always see a dip over Christmas, but it's going steadily up. And we have uh, around 500, 600 weekly active members, which is a really nice number. Uh, and uh, the blue line is members who post it. So that one is sort of not growing as much, but there's a lot more people reading all the messages. So those are the statistics. I just wanted to encourage you to send us any news that you would like the community to be aware of, and we can put them into the newsletter. And we are always happy to amplify any messages on Twitter that you think might be interesting for the community. 
and we are also having some discussions about changing our newsletter platform, which is currently tied to the membership platform. And since that's causing an issue, we are going to switch the platform for newsletter. So there will be some technical challenges in the next year. And if you would like to help out, uh, the working group looking at comms is open to the community. So please do get in touch with comms at the RSE uh, Society email. And I think that's all from me. And I will hand over to Fergus. All right, money. So try not to get too excited. Uh, so this is a quick report of uh, how much money we have um, received and spent in the last uh, in the last financial year. So our financial year runs from the 1st of July to the uh, 30th of June every year. And in that period for, for the last um, year, our income was just over £165,000. That's mostly from conferences, um, from, from the conference income, and then also a bit from memberships. And I'll break down on the next slide exactly the, the proportions. And then expenses. Again, the vast majority of our money is spent on the conference. But then after the conference, we have all sorts of other costs like infrastructure, bank fees, etc. And again, there's going to be a quick breakdown on that. But first, I wanted to highlight the fact that um, we had a rather large surplus um, in the last uh, reporting period, and that's for two main reasons. One is we took a fairly cautious approach to the conference last year. It was the first in-person conference post-COVID, and when we were organizing the conference, we didn't really know exactly what was going to be happening uh, with the pandemic. So we we took a, a series of steps to, to mitigate potential bad scenarios uh, where we might have had to either reduce the size of or potentially cancel elements of the conference, it turned out to uh, not be necessary to take any of those steps. And as a result, we ended up making rather more money on the conference than we perhaps would have done in, in another year. And that certainly won't be the case this year. We will be losing money on this year's conference for a variety of reasons. The Of that 61k surplus, approximately £40,000 was because of uh, last year's conference. So that was essentially the surplus on the conference was 40,000. And the rest of the 20,000 uh, surplus is mostly accounted for by the fact that this year's conference, we started selling tickets earlier. And because the financial year doesn't line up very well with the conference year in terms of clean breaks, there's, um, there's, there's money in last financial year that relates to this conference. And so that's why the, the surplus is much bigger this year than it will be next year. I just also want to point out that our accounts are subject to an independent examination uh, by our accountants. So that's uh, mainly to give you and also the Charities Commission some um, confidence that we're not doing anything silly with our money. Okay, so of the income that we had in the last financial year, the majority of that was conference tickets. But again, that includes almost all of last year's conference tickets and also a decent proportion of this year's. So that's why it's pretty high. Conference sponsorship was the next biggest. 30% of our income last year was conference sponsorship. Again, that's gone down this time round. And then 8% was membership fees. In terms of what we spend the money on, again, the vast, vast majority is on putting on this conference every year. But after that, we have infrastructure. So that's some of our cloud services and, and uh, our membership platform, etc. Then we have bank fees every time we sell the conference tickets, et cetera, that then you know, payment providers take a small cut of that and it adds up to a substantial amount over the course of a year. Um, we then also have event and initiative sponsorships. This is something that's already been mentioned and we just want to highlight the fact that we're really keen to increase the amount of events that we sponsor over the course of a year. So we really want to get more people coming to us wanting money for events. And generally speaking, if it's a sensible event, we will give you money towards uh, the, the costs for that. And then we have other smaller contributions to our expenses, things that we need to do to kind of keep the society ticking over. I think that's it. Thank you, Fergus, and the rest of the trustees. I will now just switch over. Is this going to be here? Yeah, there we go. So q and I'm going to... In fact, are both of these microphones on? I might even put one here so that I don't have to run around too much. You can stand up to answer, but um, so you're on camera, but uh, uh, so we've got two microphones. So first question up, where should we be seeking to engage with potential new members of the community now that Twitter is dying? Are there Evelina from comms? I will answer this one. 
please do come to our communications working group and let's discuss that. Yes, okay, so um, our, our Slido moderator is merging very similar duplicated questions. So it might be that you've asked a question that disappears uh, only if it's being combined with another we consider identical or very, very similar question. So I'm sure there are plenty of questions asking about Twitter or whatever we're calling it these days. Um, up next, in Dan Katz's talk, he told us that US RSE was intending to recruit staff to take on some of the core work. Is this something that's been considered by SOC RSE? So yes, they're able to do that because they have a very generous uh, grant from uh, the Sloan Foundation. We don't have such a grant. So we need to then think about like, what would we do with the money? How would we use it to increase the sustainability of the society? And how would that be supplementing other work than we do? So we do have at the moment a donation of time from the Software Sustainability Institute of some of Lindsay Ballantyne's time, which they donate as a, we want the society to be able to do the things that they can do. And so they donate us some of her time in a similar fashion to how Claire was providing some of her time to the society before. So we have some level of paid support, but it's not staff that we are managing directly. It's a donation of time from the SSI. So then we need to think about how we would use the money like this. And I think it was important what Dan was saying that the key thing with using the money from the Sloan that they had to pay for an executive director is that position is then their job to work out how to make the society um, sustainable from that point on. But that's a bootstrapping problem. You need to make that business case, find someone who's willing to fund that work at a substantial rate to hire someone who's able to do the work to provide that kind of long-term sustainability. And that's hard to do. The uh, process of getting grants, finding funding agencies in the UK is not a trivial thing to do. We can't apply for money from the traditional um, funding councils because we're not a research institute. So we'd have to be going to other bodies. So maybe that approach is something, it's something we're going to be looking into, but it's something that to do on the scale that they've done takes a lot of our time and we haven't ourselves got, you know, uh, all of that, um, all that time ourselves as trustees. So we're trying to work out how that might negotiate. Other than that, we're looking at potential other routes of being able to support the work of the society. Wow. I don't know if that counts as a, as a repeat question or not. <laughs> um, so maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, we will be uh, looking at other ways that we can maybe start increasing our, our income to provide an ongoing support because we can't hire someone for like a year, run out of money. And then what we're going to do next, we need to have some way of making it sustainable because we need to be making sure we have a legal responsibility to spend charity money wisely, not just spending it all on staff. If that's not going to get the result we want. So if you have ideas, if you have, a million pounds hanging around that you want to provide to the society, we'd be very happy to put together a business case to justify why we would spend it well. Um, but it's one of several routes that we're going to be looking at taking. Thank you. Hi, so I'm Sam. I'm the conference events lead. Um, basically, part of it is the economic downturn. Um, so lots of people who would have sponsored us in previous years told us that they were no longer able to sponsor us or they would require longer notice to sponsor us or they went down a tier. So uh, a large chunk of the difference is because Oracle, um, they found uh, being a platinum sponsor last year, hugely effective. So they decided they were going to spend the money to become a platinum sponsor of the US RSC conference. Uh, <laughs> and so we're grateful they've actually come back this year um, for a bronze sponsorship, uh, but that was, that was quite a significant difference. Um, and also basically we, we unfortunately weren't necessarily as prepared as we could slash should have been for um, just the Bravo is an agent, right? Uh, the, the sheer gap <laughs> that that left in our uh, our schedule. So we just didn't have as much time to get sponsorship as we would have liked. Um, and also costs have increased because this is the first year we are doing um, a hybrid conference. Uh, hybrid conference at costs are on the order of, I think, about £15,000-ish. Um, but the tickets are only a hundred pound per person. Um, and they do not cover the expense of making it, um, hybrid, but streamed. Um, and having talked to the commerce organizer we, we've taken on, um, 
done a it's the case that it never covers the cost of the, the sale of streaming tickets never covers the cost of making a conference streaming so that's the thing we're going to have to consider going forward so obviously for accessibility uh reasons we really want the conference to be streamed um we need to try and understand ways that we can make it sustainable because otherwise it it just doesn't pay for itself um so yeah uh, apologies to evil streaming uh, and thank you to slides live for doing a great job this is why we want to keep we want to keep doing it um so yeah that's from from my perspective uh, i don't know if fergus has any more sort of uh yeah, so I think you've, you've nailed the two the two big ones. I, I'm happy to just put some numbers on it. Uh, sponsorship for the conference last year, we got £50,000 and we got half that this year. So conference sponsorship went down by a factor of two. And the difference between last year when we were able to record and upload everything to YouTube, the difference between that and the full hybrid is an increase of about 15000 So those are the two main factors. Great, thank you. I think it's... a uh... It's always an experiment doing these things. It was the first time we done a hybrid conference. We're learning about where the costs are most effectively used, making sure that we're providing the best experience to both our in-person and online participants. Um, we can't keep on losing money every single year, so we're going to have to find ways to manage that system uh, as we move forward. So next question, what are the reasons? No, nope, that's what we just did. Last year, an advisory group had been formed for the society. What have they been doing? So we had a advisory group meeting just today, in fact. So the role of the advisory group is to get a little bit of advice and expertise from outside the board of trustees to just give us some guidance and input. It's formed of mostly ex-trustees or people who are involved in the early community of the, of the association and then into the society, but not exclusively. Um, they are there to answer questions we have. Like, for example, in the advisory group meeting today, we were asking them for advice on how should we look at making the society financially sustainable, for example, looking at grant funding, looking at how we can work with universities to make the pay for time of individuals at universities to support the work the uh, society is doing, but on a case by case basis. The advisory group's job is not to go away and do our work for us. It's there to be a sounding board and a voice of reason and expertise to answer the questions that we don't know the answers to or to give advice where we might be at a bit of a deadlock or not quite sure how to proceed. They're just an invaluable uh, group of people who can just guide us in those areas. Over time, we're going to be looking to bit by bit refresh the advisory board. Continuity is really useful in these things, but at the same time, we don't want a stale board. So as time goes on, we'll probably cycle through people, but at the moment we are having meetings relatively um, infrequently, once or twice a year at the moment. So just having them as a sounding board every now and again has just been a really, really useful thing to have. Uh, would the society consider supporting PhD, masters, undergraduate students to attend our conference if they were considering pursuing an RSE career? I'm happy if someone else wants to answer this, but we would consider it. And I'll let Sam speak to his thoughts. Thank you. Uh, so we do. Um, so I actually attended my first conference as a PhD student, considering a career in RSC. Uh, we have bursaries available for people who uh, would like to attend, um, but can't because their institution won't fund them. Uh, we offer free tickets for volunteers. So um, a great way for I, one of the, I attended my first conference as a volunteer. Um, if you're a volunteer, your ticket is free um, and there's support available, bursaries available for people who can't get support. Um, I think we've had... Have we had undergraduates volunteer? I'm not sure if anybody knows, but we've def we definitely have PhD students volunteer. I'm pretty sure I had master's students volunteer. So uh, good news. Yeah, if, if you're interested, um, if you know somebody who's interested, please tell them to apply for our bursary schemes uh, and to apply to become a volunteer and they can come along and join the community. Wonderful. I'm just going to check the time to make sure we have Yes, we do. We've got time for the final election part. Um, yeah, and in fact, if you feel like there could be additions, changes, enhancements, mutations to the bursary and support schemes we provide, a great way to take part in that conversation is to join the conference committee. Early on in the process, we can start having conversations about, is there a different model that might work for certain individuals that we haven't considered? This is why committees work, because you get a diversity of experience and opinion. So take part in that, or just email us if you have opinions. 
that's always okay too. So I suggest having a more expensive ticket, that's a good way to start, um, for commercial attendees of the conference, say 500 pounds instead of 300. This is exactly, this is something we were talking about earlier today. In fact, this is something which I think that we would consider. Um, it might fit in with that PhD student thing. I've been to conferences where they've given reduced tickets to certain classes and more expensive tickets to others. Uh, I think it's something that the conference committee and the conference treasurer for next year will be considering. It's something that we've discussed before. Uh, there's a certain amount of reticence to charge companies just because they're attending, because some of them have been long time supporters and some of them are sponsoring and maybe they're paying for additional people. Um, but when it comes to making sure the conference is financially sustainable, I think that it's a reasonable thing to consider. Any thoughts or input? No, good. Slack channel comes up pretty much every year. But if the financial support isn't being used, should we consider paying for Slack? Anyone over there want to weigh in on this? Yep, you've got the microphone there. If you start paying for Slack, it's extremely difficult to stop paying for Slack. So that would be locking us into a potentially unlimited sort of future bill. And it's also phenomenally expensive. Even if we qualified for the 85% discount, the number of active weekly participants on the Slack channel would make it expensive. I can't remember the figures, but we have looked into this before and it was a humongous amount of money. It would mean that we couldn't run a conference. It's <laughs> it's on that level and we've got to weigh up the pros and cons. Early on, I mean, I was there around in 2016 or so when the Slack channel was starting to form. And even at that point, there was a diversity of opinion about should we be using Slack? Should we use something open source or self-hosted? But the most important thing to do was just to get something where the community could talk to each other. It has problems with it, the whole 90 day expiry, but it's not a long-term archiving tool. It's a communication tool for ephemeral short-term communications. There might be other tools that are better, but we can't just take all your email addresses and put it on the new platform because of data protection reasons and GDPR. So we'd have to start a new community and hope that you follow and that never works. So. We are constantly thinking about how to approach the problem, but unless someone's an uh, absolute genius of how this could work, um, we haven't got an answer of how it could effectively work to move off until that point, especially given the fact that it's, it's ridiculously expensive. What is the maximum, that's a tricky question to answer, a maximum weekly commitment for a trustee in serving the society? So, yep. Okay, I will answer, keep that one in your mind and I'll come to that one afterwards. Um, if they're merged, that's fine. So uh, we expect that it's something like two days a month, minimum commitment. That is covering the meetings that we do and the small amounts of work between the meetings to kind of keep your position in that sort of um, tenable. So that's 10%, that's like the absolute minimum you can do to do things. Realistically, we're talking 20% of your time. Um, to be able to actually keep things sort of working along. Some of us, and at certain times, spend a lot more than that. In my time as treasurer, sometimes I would spend an entire week just doing treasurer stuff because there was things to be done that needed to work out. Sam, for example, on the conference organization stuff, has spent a huge amount of time, much more than half a day a week working on this stuff. So it varies a lot. What we would say is, um, first of all, talk to your line manager or your boss, or if you're self-employed, then talk to yourself about it. Make sure they're okay with the time you're spending. A lot of universities and institutions and companies have got stipulations about donating time for charity work and things like that. So see what the rules are there. And other than that, we want to take you on as a trustee, regardless of how much time you have. We want you to give the time that you have. And if you can give more, that's brilliant. If you can give less, then that's still more useful than not having you at all. But be honest about how much time you have. If halfway through your term, you realize I haven't got time for this, you can stand down as a trustee. That has happened uh, at least once before because jobs changed and life changed and things happened. But rule of thumb, I'm gonna say 10 to 20% of your time is what you'd be expecting, which sounds like a lot, but it folds into quite strongly, I imagine a lot of our job descriptions here. And if any of the RSE leaders aren't supportive of you as an RSE, for example, running as a trustee, I'll have a word with them, so that's fine. Um, and what was the second part of that question? Oh, okay, perfect. Uh, what is the primary responsibility of a trustee? What kind of ex experience is necessary to become one? I'll answer the second half first. 
no experience is necessary to become a trustee. We want your enthusiasm and your energy and your time. You don't need to be an expert at anything. I started as a trustee and I was working as a vice treasurer and then went up to become a treasurer. I had no experience of doing accounting and finance. I had some mentoring and some help and we have some accountants who gave us some advice and I learned on the job. Then I became the president. I have no experience of managing or running a society, but as a team with some guidance from previous presidents, I was given the support I needed to do these things. So if you were interested in learning some skills, that's a great thing to reason to put yourself forward. Or if you have skills, particularly around law and finance, that's the places that we always have the most difficulty. We would value those skills particularly. But apart from that, we just want people with brains who can think and help. And that's, that's really what we're asking for. The primary responsibility of a trustee, the primary responsibility, is to ensure that charity resources are spent effectively. That is the job, according to the uh, objectives of society, that is the job of the trustee. Now there's layers of hierarchy and bureaucracy below that through which we actually affect that expenditure of resources, be it time or money, um, but uh, they are varied and many. And from what you saw from the trustee today, maybe your job is mostly writing the newsletter and sending out. Maybe your job will mostly be running our virtual machines and our WordPress installation. Maybe your job will mostly be making payments and sorting out invoices. There's a lot of different roles in there. I think there's a place for everyone if, the, if you wanted to get involved. I'm just going to check time. I want to hand over to David 10 2. Would that be enough time? One more question. Okay. Um, is We can answer both of those, I think, because they're probably worth doing. So I'll let Dave answer that top one and then we'll come to Sam for the second. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm Dave Bevan, and I've had the pleasure to be elections chair for this year. So the question is, and it's a good question, why has things changed? I'm not sure if they've necessarily changed for this year, but what we found previously is that if trustees step down at the AGM, which would be today, and voting starts today, then there's at least three, four weeks where we are down one third of our trustees. So one of the reasons is to keep us at full complement so we can keep on working the society for your benefit. Reason number two is sometimes it's useful to give our candidate trustees an opportunity to put forward their case in writing. Not everybody wants to present verbally in front of this audience. We've got a membership of 700 people, give or take. 700 people do not come here, look around. So this is a way of engaging more people with the run-up, um, if that makes sense. So yeah, happy to discuss further though. Thank you, Dave. I'll just hand over to Sam for that last question. Hello. Yes, I am very sorry that once again, the conference is not, is in the first year of, um, first week of the school year. We are really sorry. We try really hard. Um, basically the problem is that in order to get a really desirable time like this week, you have to like that week, rather, you have to book really far in advance. Um, which for us means we need to line up an affordable venue that meets all of our accessibility criteria is in a location that has um, good transport links um, and also has a chair available for it. So lots of conference chairs, lots of people are only available to conference chair a conference if it's at their institution. Um, so for example, their, their work won't let them, If even if we found, say, a good venue in warwick or wherever they wouldn't be allowed to chair there because their work would only let them chair at the institution where they are employed um so it's really difficult we need to we need to line these things up very far in advance but within academia as people move around a lot it can be quite hard and obviously lots of people who are in the career stage where they would start being a conference chair are also sort of in the stage of life where they have kids or things and so they cannot predict or guarantee that they'll be available to chair in two years time which is kind of the we need at least that to get a good year um so if you would like to get the conference at a good date then please um try talking to your local university talk to your institution if you think you've got a, an area where there is a venue that could cope with this side of conference um, and in a city where there's good transport links, then please try talking to your university, getting a quote. Um, and as well, if you know somebody who could chair the conference, just kind of, if you can try and line up a package like that and contact the society, we can move forwards and start booking these things further in advance. Cause unfortunately we have to book 
this year's co- we have to work whilst we're running this year's this year's conference arrange next year's conference start scoping things out for the year after that's conference and with the staffing we have it's just really hard to do so we sh- we're hoping to try and move to more of a model where we kind of like say hey who wants to run the conference and people can can propose it um but yeah so if, if that's a thing that that you can do at your institutions um it would really help us uh yeah believe me we really really do not want to keep having it this week over and over because as well it limits who we can have to conference chair because lots of conference chairs prospective chairs can't do it in this week but we we need the lead time um and a good venue so i'm sorry i wish i could give a better response but thank you sam thank you very much so yeah, I mean, do do get in contact with the events team if you have thoughts and questions, or if you'd like to take part in that process. We're very happy to give you some advice. So, uh, are we just slide showing? Over to you, Dave. Oh, this is the exciting bit. Okay, so thank you for your questions. I'm sure I'm sure we'll take the ones that we didn't get a chance to answer on Slido. We'll take forwards and we'll get back in touch with you. It's really important that you do that. All right. So this is important for a number of you in this room. And thank you. So um, I've been chair of the elections committee, ably supported by Matt, Martin and Evelina. Our constitution allows us to recruit up to seven trustees in this round. We've had eight candidates that have stood. Now that's fantastic. We've had a competitive process. It's also a shame for that one person that doesn't make it this time around. So. We will guarantee to work with that individual, give them a role. There's loads of those wonderful working groups, which you heard from earlier, that gives all of you an opportunity to engage. And I know that person will. And I thank them and all of the candidates for standing. Very quickly, elections ran from 11th of August to the 5th of September. So candidates nominated themselves, gave their statements, and many of the members were voting. The voting process, the votes don't come through to me. We have two wonderful scrutineers this year, John Cooper and Simon Hetrick. They were the ones that you were submitting your token to and your various votes. And like all good award ceremonies, somebody comes on the video screen, says they can't be there. Usually it's the recipients of a reward. Uh, This time it's your scrutineers. So they are going to scrutinize and reveal the results. So over. Oh, sorry, big button. Here are the candidates. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, I want to thank all of them. And if you're in the room, can you just sort of stand up and we'll give you a round of applause quickly for standing. So thank you. And we have a couple of people online as well, which and I'm not going to press the buttons because it'll interrupt my thing. But thank you. You astound me that you care about this community and you want to do this. So over to the results. Here we go. I am going to press the video and you're going to listen. Let me know if you cannot hear it, particularly at the back. Hello and welcome to the, I shouldn't have pressed the, big button. the no, election results for the Society of RSC Trustee Elections 2023. Uh, this is presented by your independent scrutineers, myself, Jonathan Cooper from University College London and Simon Hetrick from the University of Southampton. Before we get to the results themselves, I just wanted to briefly explain how the voting and counting process has worked. RSE elections are run by the single transferable vote system. Uh, So people who vote rank candidates in preference order. um, And these are used to work out which candidates are elected to the seven trustee positions that are currently vacant. Um, On previous occasions, we've actually had um, as many candidates as vacancies, and so it has been a non-contested election. On this occasion, we had eight candidates for the seven vacant positions, um, and so there is actually a contest involved. Um, For those that are interested in the technical details, um, the code we're using um, is using the PyRank vote Python library to implement STV. This uses a modified droop quota, um, so the number of votes that you need in order to be elected is the number of valid votes divided by one greater than the number of seats or positions available. Um, And 
once a candidate has enough votes to be elected, um, all of the people that vote for that candidate, their second choices are then taken into account um, uh, and redistributed to candidates that weren't elected in the previous round of voting um, with a fractional transfer. So uh, um, basically a proportion of everybody's second choice vote is taken into account um, to be as fair as possible. I'll now hand over to Simon to talk about some of the statistics of the vote. Yes, so we're going to um, just quickly go through the voting statistics. So 101 responses were recorded on the voting form. Uh, there were two duplicate votes, and so we took the latest um, vote with, with both of those. There was one invalid vote, um, but that's okay. That was us testing that the invalid votes were actually identified, so we can safely ignore that one. Um, and that left us with 98 valid votes. That gives us a quota of 12.25 votes to qualify for a, a place uh, on the committee. Uh, and finally, just to raise the point that there are 680 members currently in the society, so we're looking at around about a 15% turnout for this election. And now the moment you've all been waiting for, the results of the election. Um, we had two rounds of STV in order to reach a final conclusion. Um, after the first round, four of the candidates had reached the quota. Uh, so congratulations to Mary Chester Cadwell, Steph Piatek, Lindsay Ballantyne and Peter Schmidt. Second choice votes for those candidates were then shared out and this was sufficient for another three candidates to reach the quota threshold. Mike Simpson, Fliss Guest and Twin Karmak Arm are also elected as Society of RSC trustees this year. So congratulations to all the new trustees. And just to just to finalize everything, we've also sanity checked the results. So we looked at the results in Google Forms just to confirm the, the number of duplicate votes received. And we also looked at the preferences as, um, as shown by, by the Google Form, just to ensure that they actually look as though they, they reflect the final outcome, which they do. And with that, I think we are um, signing off and can say once again, congratulations and thank you. Um, put your hands together for that amazing duo that announced the results. And I'm going to see if I can reveal the individuals that are online, if we have anybody. Yeah. Ooh. No, we don't. I'm afraid to say we don't have any of our winners online. But thank you again. Thank you to these amazing people. Um, do join us uh, tonight and celebrate very hard. One last round of applause for everybody who stood. Thank you. OK, then I think it's back to Matt. I'll dive in and this is just a very, very quick wrap up. I think we're pretty much on time and then we can all get ready for our dinner. So thank you. I think firstly, it's not the end of the conference yet, but as the society president, I feel a great debt of gratitude to the entire conference committee, organizers, volunteers and all. So I'd like to just ask a round of applause for the conference committee and this wonderful conference they've been putting on. I'd like to thank the trustees, particularly those who are standing down and moving on to other parts of their job or focusing on different things. I want to thank the trustees who are staying on to carry on the good work. And I want to thank all the people, again, who stood and were elected as trustees this time as well. So thank you to all of you. I want to thank the members of the society. Your support of the society is really, really helpful. And I think in this, I include not just the members of the society, but all of the people in the community as a whole coming to the conference, doing things. So this is all of you folks here in the room, all of you folks online. I want to say thank you to all, you all very much. And I'll see those of you who are in person at the dinner tonight. Thank you very much.